Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in person as well as virtually to Grand Rounds today. Um, I'm Dr. Daniel Dickstein, Chief of Child Psychiatry at McLean, and it is my extreme pleasure uh, to welcome today Michael Block, a uh, longtime colleague and amazing person. Why is he an amazing person? Well, hard to summarize it in just sort of a short amount of time, um, but Michael. Um, does many things and he does them really well. So Michael is an associate professor in the Child Study Center at Yale. He's the director and co-founder of the Pediatric Depression Clinic at the Child Study Center at Yale. Um, he co-directs the T32 Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Childhood Neuropsychiatric Disorders. Um, and he's also uh, the associate program director of the Albert Solnit Integrated Training Program at the Child S Study Center. Um, that program in particular, I think, is really amazing. That program is really training the next generation of child and adolescent psychiatry trained researchers in a way that's truly unique across the United States um, and really the world and is really serving as the role model for that training, not just of child psychiatrists, but also of psychologists and other professionals. Um, Thrilled today to have Michael just talking about one slice of his very varied research uh, to talk about pediatric depression, evidence-based and emerging de treatments, including ketamine. Michael, thank you so much for coming. I don't know. I think I paid you to say I was an amazing person, but uh, I'm not sure my wife would agree. I hope she would. but. Um, I, I guess um, just in uh, thinking about who I am, it'll, it'll kind of become clear in the talk. But the big thing I am is I'm a doctor who treats patients. I treat kids uh, with a variety of psychiatric illnesses. I also help train doctors. And a lot of what I do is trying to figure out answers to important clinical questions for my patients. Uh, and, and really the best source of those questions are students, doctors, patients and their families and so I like to do a lot of the clinical work along with the clinical trials and I'll be talking about ketamine which actually all came about from one of our uh, Solnit residents now doctors Jenny Dwyer who really came up with a good idea and I'll talk about why and kind of act like it's mine but it was really just uh, nurturing good people and trying to get out of the way. Um, here's the research support I have. The relevant one is uh, Janssen, who uh, makes S-ketamine that I'm going to talk about in the presentation. Um, and a few of these others are more relevant to the uh, Tourette's work that I do. Uh, so what are we going to talk about? The first one is the burden of pediatric depression. I think if you get one thing out of this talk is pediatric depression is a major public health problem. Um, and we really probably don't take it as seriously as we should. Um, we're going to talk about evidence-based treatments for pediatric depression, really focusing much more on the medications and the therapy side of things. Um, talk about kind of augmentation strategies in pediatric treatment-resistant depression. And last, talk about ketamine and why uh, Jenny and I got very interested in ketamine as a novel treatment for depression. Um, so the three leading causes of death in adolescents and young adults. So uh, one is accidental death. Second leading cause of death is suicide um, in the population. So it's, it's really a major cause not, not only of morbidity but also mortality in our patients. And, and I think we really need to start thinking about depression and suicidal ideation in adolescents like it's the second leading cause of death in the population. Um, so suicide facts from the CDC, if you look at high schoolers in the United States, 17% uh, have considered attempting suicide in the last year, 14% have had a suicide plan, 8% um, have attempted suicide in the last year, 3% have had a suicide attempt that required medical attention, and there are uh, 5,500 deaths by suicide a year in adolescence. So this is uh, Hamden High School. Uh, where my, in Connecticut, where my kids are going to go in a few years, and that's five Hamden High School's worth of kids. Um, so I, in being a good person, I hope I'm a good father, and hopefully that's part of that. I'm not 100% sure. I try to be. I don't always succeed. Um, this, this is my wife and, our, and my three kids. Uh, so there's Angie, my wife, and there's Rachel, who was eight at the time of this picture, and Sam and Paul, who were five. This was pre-COVID, you can tell because I had all my hair then. Um, it's about five years ago. It's amazing how, how. anyway. Um, 
just uh, I'll stop looking at the picture and keep going. Um, so, so there's going to be. I really worry about this in, in my kids. So there's going to be one year where all three of my kids are going to be in high school together. Um, there, in that one year, there's basically a 50-50 chance that one of my kids will have considered suicide in that year. About a 40% chance that one of them would have had a suicide plan. There's about a 20-25% chance that one of them would have actually attempted in that year. And there's you know, uh, something like a 9% chance that one of, one of them would need medical attention for a suicide attempt. And, and, and the other thing is, during their high school careers, the odds favor that they'll actually have a classmate uh, who dies by suicide, or they'll know someone in their, in their school that dies by suicide. And, and to me, that's just, uh, it just sort of puts the facts in perspective. And I, I certainly see this a lot in, um, in the patients that I treat, and I worry about this for my kids, and it's coming up soon. Uh, Rachel's off to high school next year. Um, the other thing that's, I think, hard about this, or maybe good about this, is that we actually have really effective treatments for depression. So this is the TAD study, basically 440 adolescents who were randomized for 12 weeks to medication alone, in this case fluoxetine, CBT, the combination of both, or placebo. And, and we know from the study that the combination treatment works quite well. It, about 71% of the sample responded um, at the 12 weeks of treatment. Um, in this case, uh, fluoxetine worked significantly better than placebo and worked faster than CBT. Um, CBT did kind of worse in this trial than most, but we now really know we have two effective monotherapies. Um, certainly was effective for uh, many of for many of the outcomes in this study and certainly overall, that we really have two effective treatments for uh, pediatric depression, both the medications and the therapy. And they work quite well, especially in combination. So we can get a lot of these kids better. Um, if you look at treatment guidelines in terms of ACAP and uh, NICE in the UK, they differ slightly. Both recommend just uh, psychotherapy or supportive psychotherapy for mild depression. I think this is for multiple reasons. One is psychotherapy has less side effects than uh, medications. The other one is that a, a lot of kids uh, in, in trials uh, respond to placebo or get better over time. So I think there's a good chance that many of the kids who are initially coming in with mild depression that they're going to get better. Um, and it would be better not to have them on a medicine that they're taking uh, for a while if, if they don't need it. Um, in the U.S., um, uh, and for moderate to severe depression, the U.S. is psychotherapy and or medication, uh, fluoxetine. Um, in the U.K., it's therapy plus minus medication. So they really, in their guidelines, they uh, suggest everyone gets uh, psychotherapy. And I, I think that's slightly different. I, I worry in the U.S. that a lot of our access issues are dictating our um, our, our guidelines and our policies, because I, I think there's, uh, we'll get into more lady, later, but when you start a kid on an antidepressant, you need to monitor them anyway, and there's really not much reason to not be giving them psychotherapy while you're monitoring them. Um, so, um, uh, do SSRIs work in kids? I think there's really good data that they work well. This is a, um, a meta-analysis that uh, Dave Brent and uh, Bridge did a, a while back, and essentially uh, says if you look at the absolute risk difference in improving uh, various psychiatric conditions and the number needed to treat for suicidal ideation, um, these medicines work for depression, OCD, and anxiety, um, and they and they have a fairly favorable so, uh, side effect profile. Um, when do they work? Um, so I, I think the um, so I think there's sort of the, uh, we did a, uh, uh, we looked at all the randomized controlled trials of uh, SSRIs in kids and looked in depression and looked at the time course of response. And the big thing to say is in these trials, just like the trials in adults, uh, the greatest incremental benefit of the medicines in the first couple weeks of treatment. Uh, that being said, um, it takes a while to make sure the medicines uh, re until the medicines reach their full effect or that you know that they're not going to work. 
Um, I think the other caveat to this is I think they, these medicines are dosed much more aggressively in trials than they are in clinical practice, and I think that would uh, often affect the uh, sort of the response curve you see. Um, uh, suicidal ideation risk is, uh, um, as, uh, you know, has the uh, box warning on it. Um, this is the data that was based on meta-analysis of a little over 4,000 uh, pediatric patients. Uh, found a small but significant increase in spontaneously reported suicidal thoughts or acts. Um, the absolute risk difference was uh, was one percent. Um, uh, so, uh, if you treated one hundred pediatric patients who were uh, who with an antidepressant medication, only only one, and if you're going to take the confidence interval, two of them would experience uh, short-term increases in suicidal ideation or behavior. Um, it's important to note that there weren't any completed suicide attempts, and I think the other things to uh, note about this is that they uh, it often gets like hidden in the background of the actual FDA meta-analysis, but they systematically assess suicidal ideation as a rating, you know, as a rating scale item of depression, and they found no signal um, in terms of the antidepressants actually increasing suicidal ideation when it was. Uh, when it was assessed in all the patients. Um, so I think it, it came out small on one outcome measure and not on another. Um, um, and just to say this was the um, other table looking at the particular agents and just to keep in mind that it was, uh, um, it was, it seemed, if anything, it was, uh, it was lesser in the longer acting uh, antidepressants and greater in the shorter acting antidepressants in terms of a signal but it's not like the non this was uh, a specific SSRI uh, mediated effect um, and then just I talked about the absolute uh, uh, I talked about the uh, the response and the absolute response numbers before these are the uh, risk difference in terms of the uh, medication and that um, these medicines are very likely to improve uh, depression and very unlikely to make uh, suicidal ideation worse and um, another way of looking at this uh, so so if you're looking at this I think I blew the first slide before so I, I will re-explain it and make sure they so the absolute uh, risk difference is in the left column for response in depression the number needed to treat is on the right for depression, and then the on the on the right on this side, the absolute risk difference in terms of risk of suicidal ideation is on the left, and on the right is the number needed to harm in terms of worsening suicidal ideation. Um, another way of looking at this, so this is a Cates plot. It's one of these evidence-based medicine tools. This is a thousand kids who are theoretically have depression um, that are treated. Um, uh, with an antidepressant. Uh, the green represents those are going to get better whether you put them on the antidepressant or placebo over the short term trial in terms of a response. The yellow are the ones that are going to specifically get better um, because of the antidepressant medicine. Uh, the gray are uh, uh, patients who uh, uh, report, kids who uh, report increased suicidal ideation that would have happened. Uh, whether on they're on the medication or placebo, and then the red ones are the ones that uh, might have increased suicidal ideation that might be due to the medicine. And the big thing is the yellow is much more than the red. Um, and uh, um, and just looking at it for anxiety, uh, figures mean the same thing. And OCD, it's clear that the benefit is greater and the risks are less in in the comorbid conditions. That being said, the antidepressants are still by far the, uh, and the SSRIs are still by far the best medication we have um, in terms of treating kids. Uh, so how do I discuss the black box warning with families? Um, first thing I say is that it's the best medicine we have, that there's really good evidence that it works for depression, OCD, anxiety. Um, I talk about that there's uh, some evidence of a signal in terms of short-term increase in Suicide, reported suicidal ideation in the trial, so they put a warning on the medicine. That being said, it's really unclear, I think the first thing, whether that was the right outcome to look at, whether they should have just looked at the 
systematic measures of suicidal ideation, which didn't find a difference. Then the other thing is I'm not sure how good of a proxy self-reported suicidality is for attempted and completed suicide, which is what, what I think we really care about. And I, I guess as a, a clinician treating kids with depression and severe depression, I kind of assume that they all have suicidal ideation and it's a matter of degree and also how much they're willing to disclose it. And, and I think you look at the samples and it's 70% you know, plus in the patients I'm treating. So, um, so what about the other 30%? I guess it's theoretically possible they don't have any, but... Um, um, and, uh, and, and I guess, uh, um, and, and then just to be said, there's evidence from epidemiologic studies suggesting that these medicines may be, because they're treating depression, that they may be protective against overall suicide risk. Um, so then they asked why the warning is there, and I say because the FDA put it there. Um, I, I, I personally don't, don't agree with it, but what the warning does say when you look at it is, is that you, not that you shouldn't try these medicines, but that you should watch the kids closely when you're initiating an antidepressant. I think that's something we would all agree with. I, I just think in practice putting the warning on the, pa uh, on the medicine has different effects than that. But I think the big thing is the FDA says that when we start this medicine, we should watch your child closely because when they're starting at a med, uh, medication, they're at increased risk of uh, 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 suicidal ideation or suicide outcomes, and so we're going to keep track of that. Um, um, but there are a lot of problems with the available treatments we have. So whether you look at uh, behavioral therapy or medications for depression, they take a long time to work. Uh, the second thing is we can, you can be an optimistic person. I tend not to be. You can say, well, within, in uh, TAD, 71% of the patients responded to combination treatment. Well, it also means that 29% of them didn't. And, um, and that means that you're going to have you know, a third or slightly less than a third of patients under the best case circumstances that are not responding to the initial treatment. I think another big problem we have, especially in pediatric depression, is that the medicines really work that are currently available on the same mechanism. We'll, we'll talk about some other stuff later. But we have a lot of different medicines that basically work on serotonin that have been proven to working kids. Well, not that many of them have been proven to work in kids, but they're more similar than they are different. And I think that makes uh, that makes the options uh, get less and less when you start having these kids that have prolonged depression. Um, then there are just the studies leave a lot to desire, to be desired. So there's no fixed dose study. So there's no studies saying whether 20 milligrams of fluoxetine is better than 40 milligrams or 60 milligrams for kids with depression. Um, that, that's a problem. So again, the doses are used at much lower doses and titrated much more slowly in clinical practice, in my experience, than they are in the trials. And we don't know what the right answer is to that. Um, is, is, is titrating the medicines more slowly, decreasing the risk of side effects associated with the medicine, or just pre preventing the kids from getting better? Don't know. Um, there really aren't many head-to-head -head trials of different medications. Uh, there's really poor data in younger kids. There are also a lot of other questions I'll get to later about using traditional antidepressants in kids that are incredibly clinically important that we have like no trial data on. Um, and, and this is really not surprising. So this is a figure looking at clinicaltrials.gov, and I did a wonderful search where I looked at uh, antidepressant agents, and I restricted the search to adults, geriatric patients, or pediatric patients. And these are basically the number of trials and the number of interventional trials on clinicaltrials.gov. And the basic point here is that there are a lot of trials uh, in adults with depression, and they're fairly few in kids. Um, and a good question to ask me at the end is, why is this the case? Um, Dan would be a good person to answer, too. Um, and then you get a situation like this. So these are the a comparison of the number of FDA-approved medications for depression in children versus adults. So you have a lot of medications uh, 
that have been shown to work in adults and have been studied, monotherapies, augmentation strategies, interventional therapies, and in kids you have two SSRIs that have been approved in, in, in pediatric populations, escitalopram and fluoxine. I'm not suggesting that these are necessarily the only medicines that work for depression, but these are the only ones that have gotten FDA approval. And a lot of that's probably due to challenges in terms of the research methodology, and then also that the trials haven't really been done. Um, uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, treatment-resistant and treatment-refractory depression. Uh, when, when I'm talking about it, uh, when I talk about treatment-resistant depression, they have depression, they've uh, not responded to treatment with at least one evidence-based psychotherapy and a antidepressant with grade A evidence, so fluoxetine, escitalopram, or sertraline. That's treatment resistant depression. Treatment refractory depression is the same, except I would, I would have them fail two, an, two antidepressant medications. At least one of them would be one of the three I mentioned before. Um, so we see a bunch of uh, kids and adolescents with treatment refractory depression um, at Yale. Um, First big thing to check is, did they actually get the treatments that uh, they're supposed to get? Um, first big thing is, did they, you know, if they, did they get, so for CBT, did the child get homework? Were the parents included in treatment? Uh, did it involve identifying thought patterns that may be contributing to the child's illness? Um, those are kind of the things to, to think about. And you'll often have, yes, I got CBT, and then they'll say no to any of those three things. So. You know, what, what did they really end up getting? Uh, same kind of things with medications. Uh, what dose of the medicine uh, were they taking? How long were they on it? And then the third one that's probably equally important is did the patient actually take the medicine? And, and you'd be, I'm still amazed at how many patients I see in the clinic who have failed, failed multiple medications and then you find out, so I always get pharmacy records, so I ask them to print out the pharmacy records going back, that they uh, weren't taking the medicine half the time or um, they thought they were on a high dose of medicine but they were taking 25 of sertraline instead of 250, uh, those kind of things. And I think it, um, you, you're having, there are very different interventions that can be effective in those patients, but it's probably not ketamine. You know, it would be figuring out how can you, you know, pill boxes, um, uh, how can they access treatment, what are the barriers to taking the pills, are there, are there reasons the child doesn't want to take the medicine or that they don't want to give the kid the medicine. It's a very different conversation than ketamine. Um, uh, the other thing is misdiagnosis. So a, a real big thing is uh, another really important thing um, to do is to just make sure the kid has the actual diagnosis. So we do like, uh, we do the DABA, which is sort of like a, a self-report of psychiatric illness where we essentially have the, the, the parents, the kid, sometimes the teachers, if we're lucky enough, essentially do like a structured interview of the symptoms they're having and see whether the diagnoses actually line up with what's reported, get hospital records. Because oftentimes these kids are sort of carrying, you, you find out they have something, you know, they have some trauma that you didn't know about, they have significant ADHD symptoms, uh, they could have bipolar disorder for all you know and that uh, people don't know it. Uh, oftentimes it's the other way around, but um, in terms of bipolar, but, but they're, um, it's really important these kids, if they haven't gotten better with the treatments we know that have worked, to not take for granted the diagnosis and what's going, going on because the treatment could not be working because they have something else. Uh, what do you do if they actually uh, have treatment refractory depression? Uh, so we'll talk about a bunch of different options. One is always maximizing psychotherapy. So we'll talk about some of the ketamine trials later and our treatment. Um, just it's always a good option to maximize or change psychotherapy. It's again amazing the number of kids that I'm seeing evaluating for a ketamine trial or been in the hospital three or four times and 
they have really bad depression, they have social anxiety disorder, and they keep getting referred to an IOP program with a group. Okay, well, they're not willing to talk in the group, and you can send them there 20 times, and they're not participating in it, so it's probably not the best intervention. And sending them the same treatment that's supposed to work that hasn't worked six times just doesn't make sense to me. Like, the data can say that it's a good treatment, but if it hasn't worked in the patient six times, you should probably try something else. Um, what, what are the options? So we'll talk about medication switches, pharmacological augmentation, and then uh, interventional strategies. Um, so there's really only one, I don't know if whether you count ours as a real trial, I certainly don't, um, in terms of looking at treatments and treatment refractory depression in kids in terms of medications. Um, the Tordia study uh, essentially suggested that switching to a different SSRI's uh, um, it's better is better than switching to an SNRI, not because either one works better, but because the SSRIs have less side effects than the SSRIs. Um, and then there, again, there are a lot of medications in adults that really have not shown efficacy in trials of kids, um, and these are just some of them. Um, and and it's unclear how much of that is the diff the challenges of doing trials in pediatric populations and. Um, especially with pediatric depression uh, versus whether these medicines don't work. Uh, so Tordia, just in a little more detail, this is why the, I was sort of hammering on the psychotherapy is an important thing to consider at any point. So they took adolescents with SSRI-resistant depression. They're randomized to switch to either an SSRI, a new SSRI, or an SNRI. And then they were randomized to either CBT or no CBT. And bottom line was whether you got CBT or not made the difference in terms of response, similar response rates between the two medicines, um, but this, uh, there was significantly greater side effect burden with the SNRIs. Um, so in general, if your kid fails one SSRI, general rule of thumb is to try another. Um, I guess the other thing is just there are a lot of medications that I try, seen trying in the community for kids with depression that are, I think are routinely used. I assume they're used around here a lot. Um, they have evidence of working in adults, so uh, the column, this column goes at the level of evidence for common augmentation strategies we use in adults with the level of data uh, going from A, uh, evidence from multiple randomized clinical trials or meta-analysis, B is at least uh, one controlled trial, C is uh, non-experimental studies, and D is based on expert op opinion or clinical experience. And you see that the data is much better for adults than kids, and that essentially we're relying on clinical experience, ex extrapolating our knowledge in, a, in adults to kids, and that remains to be seen how accurate that is. Um, um, looking at, uh, so I think this is something that's really popular south of here, sadly, in the neighborhood that I work in, uh, antipsychotic augmentation in kids with, uh, with in, a, in Antipsychotic augmentation for depression is very common in kids with depression. This is the data from adults. Big thing is, uh, so the bottom line, so this is the uh, results of a network meta-analysis. The big thing to look down here is this is the effect size of various different uh, commonly used antipsychotics compared to placebo. And the big thing is the effect size is small. So it's somewhere 0 0.2 seven to point four three or somewhere around there. So it has a fairly small effect and we're using this all the time. And these medicines have fairly significant side effects in kids. They cause metabolic side effects, weight gain, uh, increased risk of diabetes. It can cause, you know, tardive dyskinesia, other side effects. Um, so, um, so this is uh, sort of where the landscape is in terms of adults. So the Left slide is the odds ratio of response for the various interventions we have in augmentation strategies that are commonly used in adults with depression. And, and the right is sort of my schematic on how long the studies were done to assess how well they worked. So how long they take to work is on the right and, and how effective they were. Um, and, and keep that in mind for later, because um, we'll talk about it. Um, and it gets, it's relevant to why, why ketamine. Um, so, 
bottom line, what we know about pediatric depression right now, SSRIs are effective. There are quality evidence-based psychotherapies that are always a reasonable treatment option, even in the sickest, most refractory kids. That's part of a treatment regimen or should be for them. Um, we know that a second SSRI is likely better than an SNRI. We know a sizable proportion of kids don't get better with first-line treatments, and we know way too many children are dying by from depression and suicide at the moment. Uh, and there are a lot of things we don't know. We don't know whether higher doses of SSRIs are more effective than lower doses in the treatment of pediatric depression or OCD or anxiety. We don't know about whether these sort of slower clinical titrations used in clinical practice improve tolerability or efficacy. I, I, guess, I guess we could say we know that they improve tolerability. I'm not sure we know that it necessarily improves dropout rate or compliance. Um, we really don't know, even though we have some signal about this increased suicidality with antidepressant use, we really don't have a good understanding of what the time frame is or what the best course of treatment is if, uh, if someone actually appear, uh, experiences su increased suicidal ideation after they start an SSRI. Is it really the best strategy to stop it? I think that's something that I'm still unsure about. Um, uh, what are the risks of discontinuing a child uh, who responds to initial treatment? When should you discontinue? Um, what pharmacological augmentation strategies that are commonly utilized for depression in adults actually work in kids? Um, so this is just uh, uh, this is a schematic from an article I did with Jenny, just starting to talk about how to assess uh, treatment refractory depression in kids. So now we're switching to ketamine. So what is ketamine and why, why was I interested in it? So ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic and it's a NMDA receptor antagonist. It's used commonly in anesthesia at a much higher dose as a very quick uh, infusion. Um, it's also used as a drug of abuse, typically um, uh, administered orally, again, as a bolus. Um, in psychiatry and studies of depression, we're using a much lower dose over a longer period for the infusion, so 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over 40 minutes as opposed to one to five milligrams per kilogram over one minute if you're going to use it as an anesthetic. Um, the first study was actually done back at Yale, um, I think before I got there, it was uh, 2000, it was published. Um, eight subjects who were medication free that had depression they were they were given ketamine or saline on two separate test states and they looked at the time course of depression response they saw that uh, the ketamine had a rapid antidepressant effect compared to saline uh, the response rate was 50 percent in the eight subjects who received ketamine and 13 uh, percent response so one subject who got the uh, saline got better um, and, um, and, and just to keep this in mind, so this is someone having a response in their depression symptoms in a day as opposed to eight weeks. So if we took the where SSRIs would be, it would be less. And if I had a laser pointer, I'd be pointing somewhere, somewhere out in the hall somewhere. Um, and, and just to note that this time course is very different than the dis dissociative effects that typically peak uh, somewhere during towards the end of the infusion and last about an hour after you start the infusion um, and dissipate by two hours after you start the infusion. Um, this has been replicated multiple times. This is the results of a meta-analysis in AJP that showed that the um, that the odds ratio of uh, response at one day after ketamine treatment compared to controls in terms of response in terms of depression, the odds ratio was about 10. If you look a week out, it's around five, slightly less. Um, we did another study with individual patient data um, that I did with uh, Sam Wilkinson. We essentially took all the single dose ketamine trials for um, uh, depressive conditions, looked at the specific suicide item, took the subjects enrolled in the trial who had suicidal ideation at the beginning of the study, looked at the uh, overall course of the uh, symptoms of suicidal ideation that's on the left, and then the likelihood that they would be free of suicidal ideation on the right. And the bottom line, you saw that it had a fairly dramatic effect on suicidal ideation and 
uh, similar effect sizes around 0.7 to 0.9, and the number needed to treat was anywhere from three to five, depending to be free of suicidal ideation between day one and seven, depending on when you're looking. Um, we also found that if you controlled for all the other symptoms of depression, there was an independent effect on suicidal ideation. Um, so this is what, uh, getting back, this is what Jenny Dwyer saw when she was working on the inpatient unit as a resident and knew that I was a child psychiatrist and said, why don't we do it in kids? So again, the left is the odds ratio of response in trials and the right is the time course to the treatment effects. So basically, in adults, the ketamine works better, has a much larger odds ratio, and it works faster than the other treatments we have. Suicide and depression is a big problem in adolescents. Why aren't we doing it? That was a question she asked, and I didn't have a good answer, so we did this study. That, that's kind of how it started. Um, uh, and it was, and 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 she was, she was as a resident, she was seeing uh, the data in actual people. So you see, uh, you'd see adults who had treatment refractory depression, who were hospitalized for it, who were getting the ketamine, and you could see across the room without even talking to them that they were better the next day. That's how dramatic the, the effects you saw some of the time were. So, so it was like we've got to try this. Um, so the first question we asked is, is a single dose of ketamine safe and effective for the uh, treatment-resistant depression? Um, this paper came out in the AJP. We looked at adolescents. We looked at adolescents with major depression. They had to have fairly severe depression. They had to uh, at least meet the criteria of treatment resistance, uh, failing one prior antidepressant trial in uh, psychotherapy. Um, they had to be on stable medications. Um, because placebo response rates are high in trial, we've really spent time trying to figure out how to uh, uh, sort of get the best control possible and improve the blinding. We used midazolam as an active control, which is a benzodiazepine that uh, mimics some of the effects of ketamine, albeit not super, super well, but I don't know of anything better. Um, additionally, to protect the blinds, we, we handle this like a psychotherapy study. Um, uh, in that, yeah, so like in a psychotherapy study, you have someone doing the psychotherapy and then you have a separate rater. In this, we had someone giving the infusion and we had a separate rater for efficacy. Essentially, you need to do that because the side effects of the, or the effects of the ketamine functionally unblind the study, like if you're giving someone a particular type of therapy. Um, we did all, all the assessments at the Child Study Center. That's the beautiful building there, not nearly as nice as here. And then this is, and we do all the infusions in the hospital, which is definitely not as nice as here. Um, so 17 uh, adolescents were enrolled in the study. They got, uh, they got either uh, uh, ketamine or placebo, the midazolam, uh, in a uh, crossover trial 14 days apart. Um, we did a bunch of rating CADs to assess the side effects and monitor their vital signs during the infusions that lasted three hours. And then we had a separate set of raters do a bunch of ratings essentially to look at how they were doing at various points of time to understand the time course. Um, so looking at these 17 subjects, very similar to what I think I see in clinic now, uh, predominantly female, um, uh, quite severe depression. I think the big thing to say about this group of patients is that they were, they had been struggling with depression for an incredibly long amount of time. So the average duration of the current depressive episode was 21 months in the sample. They had tried, on average, uh, a little over three antidepressants. So they were uh, quite uh, chronic. Um, so looking at the primary outcome, uh, Madras ratings day one after infusion, uh, we saw a significant benefit of the ketamine compared to the midazolam treatment. This was an improvement of, of nine points on the Madras scale. Effect size is about 0.75, which is again a uh, pretty large effect size, pretty similar to what you see in the midazolam controlled studies um, of adults. Um, 
I think somewhat surprisingly compared to the other sites, we saw that the improvement in depression lasted longer than we expected. So you could actually see a difference between the two groups even 14 days out. Um, uh, if you look at the proportion of responders in this, we chose the response criteria 50% improvement in MADRAS anywhere in the first three days following uh, uh, the treatment because we didn't know at that time whether the time course would be similar. Um, 13 of the 17 uh, subjects responded to ketamine, 6 responded to placebo, 8 of the subjects responded to ketamine only. Um, one of the subjects responded only to midazolam, um, and that was a statistically significant difference. So that's what uh, the effect size meant. Um, we've actually started examining predictors of response, and so we have the response to ketamine on the left and midazolam on the right. If you looked at what was the predictors of the midazolam or the placebo response, uh, essentially, uh, you were more likely to respond to the midazolam if you had less severe depression on the CDRS at the beginning of treatment. Um, in terms of being more likely to respond to ketamine, it was essentially you had uh, less chronic depression, you tried fewer treatments. Um, also, if you were on an SSRI and not on an SNRI or another antidepressant, I would put the caveat on that as we already talked about earlier how they uh, there's sort of a step care and you're not going to get to the SNRIs till you're more refractory so it's probably not related to the particular agents but a vestige of, of how many agents they've tried. Um, if you looked at the moderators of treatment, so what got you better, more likely, more better on ketamine as opposed to midazolam, um, same kind of things came out. Um, so this is day one and day seven essentially uh, uh, you were more likely to get better on ketamine, uh, more past treatments, uh, or uh, less past treatments, uh, less previous antidepressant therapies, less augmentation <coughs> strategies. Um, so it, it, it's potentially suggesting that the sooner you get these kids, potentially the better. That I don't. I think the difference is that. Um, probably earlier in the course it's easier to get them better is sort of the way I thought about it. That being said, who knows how well that extrapolates to repeated treatments in a larger sample. Next, uh, dissociative effects extremely similar to adults. You saw a lot of dissociative symptoms with uh, ketamine that peaked one hour after the treatment and were gone by two hours after and you saw almost none in the midazolam group. Um, in terms of what these symptoms typically are, uh, feeling like you're in a dream uh, with ketamine, uh, uh, feeling like things are moving in slow motion, sort of these uh, perceptual disturbances, feeling like parts of your body are changed. Um, you often get this sort of spaced out feeling on either treatment. Um, uh, another thing we looked at was, were the dissociative symptoms predictive of whether you responded or not? We saw no difference in uh, the ratings of dissociative <laughs> symptoms at an hour between the responders and the non-responders to ketamine. So you were no more likely to get better if you had uh, uh, more dissociative symptoms. In terms of effects on blood pressure and heart rate, yes, you could definitely see a effect of ketamine on uh, heart rate and blood pressure, ketamine increased uh, heart rate and blood pressure, uh, midazolam slightly decreases it. Uh, that being said, the probably the, uh, the magnitude of this effect in the, in the adolescents we've seen is much less than what I've seen in, in adults that I've treated. So only four of the patients ever had a blood pressure reading that uh, met criteria for stage to hypertension at any point during the study, so greater than 140 over 90. Um, none persisted after the end of the infusion. Uh, none exceeded 150 over 95. Um, uh, so now looking at metabolites. Uh, so if we're looking at predictors of metabolites, the one finding we had was uh, that uh, hydroxynorketamine levels at 120 minutes was uh, predictive of response. So if you had higher levels of hydroxynorketamine at 120 minutes, you were less likely to get better in terms of your depression symptoms on ketamine. And 
for those of you who are not readily familiar with the metabolic pathway of ketamine, um, uh, ketamine gets uh, metabolized either hydroxynorketamine or dehydroxynorketamine. Um, and uh, ketamine and norketamine are active metabolites. These other ones are, are not. Um, and, and this is a uh, figure comparing uh, ketamine, norketamine, and hydroxynorketamine um, with the adolescents in orange and a adult, adult reference sample from Carlos Cerati in blue. So it seems like if, if anything, the adolescents we're treating are metabolizing the ketamine faster to hydroxynorketamine. And that if anything, um, having higher rates meant you responded less to the treatment. So it, it's suggesting that uh, figuring out what the exact right dose in, in adolescents may be slightly different than, than adults. Um, or understanding this metabolism may be useful in, in improving efficacy of the intervention. That being uh, conclusions, ketamine demonstrated a rapid antidepressant effect in single dose crossover trials. Side effects were short lived and well tolerated. That being said, there are a huge amount of things we don't know, and I, uh, I don't, I don't think it would be a good idea to run out and give ketamine to all your patients at the moment. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reasons. The big one is we haven't done any repeated dose studies to show that uh, ketamine prolongs the antidepressant effects. So like I've only shown that it works over a couple weeks in a small sample. Like if we give the doses repeatedly, like if we do in adults, can we uh, sustain the effect? Um, uh, will ketamine have anti-suicidal effects like have been seen in adults? Um, what's the safety of repeated doses in adolescents? We know that the safety day is pretty good in adults, but we don't have it in adolescents. Knowing what the right dose is. Um, and then I think the other thing is thinking about PTSD or anxiety or OCD treatments in adolescents too that also have substantial morbidity. Um, so uh, can uh, ketamine and ketamine derived be medications be used to decrease suicidal ideation? So this is a huge problem in adolescence. Uh, lots of kids are hospitalized with depression and suicidal ideation. I think any at any one time at Yale on the adolescent unit, at least half the kids are there for suicidal ideation. Um, the average length of stay on the unit, like other units, is about one week. We talked before the therapy and the medications really take a lot longer than that to work. So we could use things that worked faster than really the point after discharge is really a high risk time for attempted and completed suicides. And so, so this is really a quite an urgent public health need, both in adults and in, in adolescents. Uh, I talked about this paper earlier. I'm not going to go into it again. You know, that there seems like there's good data on suicidal ideation with ketamine. Um, so there is this trial that's uh, been done by Janssen that's been presented, hasn't been reported yet. Uh, this is S-ketamine, so it's the left-handed enantiomer of ketamine. It's given intranasally rather than IV. Uh, 145 uh, adolescents with uh, depression and acute suicidal ideation uh, requiring hospitalization. They were given standard of care treatment, so they were switched and put on one of the three SSRIs we talked about earlier. Um, given inpatient treatment required to get evidence-based psychotherapy, whichever group they were in, and then either they were given uh, midazolam or one of three doses of esketamine um, uh, twice a week for four weeks, and they were followed. Um, uh, this is the primary outcome, which was to compare the two highest doses of esketamine to midazolam, and the bottom line is that um, in terms of depressive symptoms at day one, uh, the two higher doses of esketamine significantly separated from the midazolam and showed a significant benefit. That being said, it's important to say that all the kids in the study, regardless of treatment, got quite a bit better, especially early on. And the other thing to say is there weren't significant differences at day 25 or at the end of the four weeks of treatment. Um, my sense of that is it's probably, don't have the figures to show you, but essentially the, ki the kids caught up in terms of the other treatments they were getting were really working. Um, also really didn't show a signal in terms of uh, suicidal ideation measurements. 
Um, so this was a, a CGI rating about how severe your depression are, is. Um, uh, essentially, at the beginning, all the all the kids, regardless of the treatment arm, are essentially in red or blue or maybe yellow, where they have, you know, moderate or moderate suicidal ideation or worse. And then by the end, almost the vast majority of them are not in that group. And 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 it's really been a challenge both in the adults and the kids studies to figure out some rating of uh, suicidal ideation that's actually potentially sensitive to treatment effects. So what are we doing now? So we're doing a, a repeated dose study of ketamine in adolescents with uh, 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 treatment resistant depression and suicidal ideation. They have to have a uh, suicide event, ER visit, um, hospitalization, IOP within 120 days of starting and have had to fail an antidepressant and psychotherapy. And so the first thing is, does ketamine work uh, better than midazolam or repeated dosing. Second thing is we're looking at imaging. Uh, third thing is we're looking at the trajectory of symptoms and whether we can sustain response um, later on in the trial. Um, and this is a slide looking at it. They get uh, either ketamine or midazolam twice a week for two weeks. Then we lock the data and uh, um, and we decide whether they're responders or not. If we then unblind and we figure out what they're getting. If they did not respond to treatment uh, and they got midazolam, then they get four doses of ketamine and then we follow them with uh, evidence-based uh, medication management and CBT for four months. And so that study's ongoing. Um, and hopefully we'll have results at some point in the next few years. Um, I think the big things to say, I should end because I'm right near my time point, is a thank you to Jenny and the other people in the lab and the patients. And uh, if you want to know more about this research, these are kind of the two papers that uh, really summarize it probably better than I do in terms of how, we, how we're thinking about treatment-resistant depression and evaluating it and treating it and the, the initial data from ketamine. So I'm ready for questions. Hi, thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, my name is Robert Meisner. I direct the Academy Service here. I'm, I'm also a child psychiatrist. It's a pleasure to meet you in person um, rather than just virtually. I'm very grateful uh, for presenting today. I was curious if I could, could pose um, a, a question to you that, that we've grappled with. If, um, when we started the service some years ago, as a, a child psychiatry part of me had really believed that although we have some, for many reasons, some constraints medically on what ages we can treat in neurotherapeutics, I had anticipated that we would be treating a lot of older teenagers with ketamine, mass ketamine. And then we began to read some of the basic science, thinking of Zimmerman and the Lancet and Nature Papers in which you know, mice are showing modeling when given antidepressant doses as adults of schizophrenia-like pathology. Uh, when taken on section as adults. And then we began to think that we were actually provoking uh, and or uncovering actual psychosis in a manner consistent with those bio biology pathology studies. And then the ACAP announcement and cautionary note came out. Um, and as we received consensus papers and checking with our colleagues, we got increasingly worried about developmental vulnerability and ketamine and the unknowns based on the basic science literature and the evidence base. And we've been wrestling to that, but at the moment have really had to be extremely conservative in this domain among patients that I really had hoped to would be treating. So I think the, the first thing is we're really eager for, for longer term information as the, some of the studies that you guys are doing. Second thing is if you, you had any thoughts on how to think about, about some of that biologic work. Um, and then third, I have been impressed, given some of the adult data you know, that we have shared with insurance companies and on many system levels over the years that the devil has been in the details and often quite hard to operationalize, um, even for adults, and uh, even with FDA-approved S-ketamine. And uh, what can we start doing to think now about potential FDA approvals down the road in the pediatric population to make oper operationalization a bit smoother than it's been 
for those of us banging our heads against the wall for the last five years to get people, you know, ketamine and us ketamine. So, so there are a bunch of good questions in there, and I, I guess I will I will start with our our trial, and we're giving four treatments of the ketamine and not eight like I think I would normally do clinically. And a lot of that was based on concerns primarily coming from the FDA based on the animal data. Um, I, I guess I feel like I'm in a really uncomfortable position at the moment if you're limiting the number of treatments we can give in terms of uh, repeated dose studies because yeah, I, I think it's I think it's right to be conservative. It's not the first thing I do. It's not the second thing I do. It's not the third thing to do. Um, it's really unfortunate that we can't get data and research when I think it's becoming increasingly commonly used clinically. And I think it's really, uh, I, I guess I tend to be a little, I, I, I think there are some reasons for, uh, there, there are definitely reasons to monitoring the effects of repeated doses of ketamine closely. I would say that there are plenty of kids who get it as an anesthesia agent repeatedly times at multiple doses and people haven't seen it. So I, I, I'm sort of like, I think it needs to be studied, I'm not sure. Certainly haven't seen psychotic presentations in the kids we've treated. Um, that being said, um, it's really hard that the kids are being treated and we're not getting the data on it. And that, and that I, I just, you know, to me, I, I think that's one of the issues I had, and I didn't, I, I honestly thought about doing this trial before Jenny showed up. Um, and one of the reasons I didn't do it was kind of the concerns about what are the potential developmental concerns. That being said, as a, um, as a father and as a clinician, suicide's the second leading cause of the, in the age group. We don't have many other options. Yes, there are theoretical long, longer term risks that I think are deserving of study but are more theoretical than um, in any way shown and I, and I just uh, I, I, I just think it's hard to do nothing in these patients who've been struggling with depression for 21 months and have limited options. That being said, all of them that we're giving it to have failed medications. I think we've loosened the criteria because one thing we've been dealing with lately is that kids are just not getting treated in the community. So they're going, a ye they have depression for a year or a year and a half and they've been tried on one medicine the whole time and they're really um, in there. Um, uh, so th that's kind of how I think about it. And I think there's really a need to collect data and do it responsibly. It's really hard to do if you can't control the people giving the juice in terms of the ketamine doses and things like that. And, and we're very strict in never giving it home, never giving it above the range. You know, uh, we're always trying to get people off after the eight treatments. We do no maintenance, really. We do it sometimes clinically, but we try it. They have to fail into it, whereas the adults, I think it's much more often done. Thank you. And do you think that the pediatric approval for us has any on the No. Uh, I think they're going to do. I think they're going to have to do another study before it gets approved. Um, I, I think they need to establish a dosage, and I think they're going to, they usually require two studies. And um, I haven't seen anything to suggest that the experience is going to be different in adolescents, but I also worry a lot that we're going to use it as a medicine to mask other problems in our healthcare system. All right. So, well, I'm just mindful of the time, so I think I think we'll wrap up and then I, you I can, can stay here and answer. If questions. you can stay and answer individual one-on-one -on -one questions, that'd be great. Let's have one final round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.